to another episode of Red Tinted Glasses. And Callum, it seems strange, it seems a long time coming, that we actually have a positive Premiership performance to speak about. The Don's running out emphatic 4-1 winners this weekend. I actually don't know how this is going to go because we are so out of practice for Aberdeen wins. It's unbelievable in the league. It is, and there's a lot of pressure on you on this episode because, of course, you are the only one out of the two of us that was at the fixture. Um, congratulations once again to, to Chris and Haley on their wedding at the weekend. There was a lot of the groom's party that were very or big fans of the show, so uh, hopefully um, by the time you guys are listening or watching this, um, your hangovers have subsided. We're, of course, recording this on Monday evening. Maybe they're just beginning to wear off. But, but Callum, you took Caitlin to, to her first Aberdeen game. Did she enjoy the game? I mean, certainly from the highlights when I got back from the wedding, I enjoyed what I saw. Um, no, she didn't enjoy the game. That's got nothing to do with Aberdeen or the game itself, because I think it was quite entertaining. Um, doesn't enjoy football too much and I think the fact everyone was standing she was a little bit she didn't enjoy everyone being cramped and and then it wasn't in Hungary so apparently that was a problem and you know you could have a beer during the game and there was no pretty much eagle brought out before and there was no and you know the red shed was very far away so she could just watch them and be entertained so I, th- I don't think she hated it, but I think I've got some work to do but I enjoyed myself so well I'm you know, not really counts here <laughs> No, I'm glad you you enjoyed yourself because there is lots to discuss. As, of course, we said, Aberdeen got their first Premiership points on the board with that 4-1 win, emulating the same scoreline that they did over the Buddies back in December of last year. Um, A point that I was remembering when people said that this team wouldn't have done that last season. Of course, two different squads, but Jim Goodwin happy to reverse the scoreline. Of course, he was on the end of in that game. One change, as was widely expected from the team that lost to Celtic, with Liam Scales returning to the starting eleven in place of Dante Polvara. Callum, we spoke on the last episode, the importance of this game was getting the three points. A, a good performance would be a, a bonus. Well, we did get that bonus. We got both. Talk us through your, your thoughts from walking out of Pataudry. <sighs> Just the one thing I was missing was the clean sheet, which... Albeit we couldn't really do too much about, but we will come on to that. I I, I was very happy. I thought we played some wonderful stuff. Um, we things seem to be starting to come together with you know players understanding how each other plays, and that's with someone being thrown in there having signed for us that morning. So I I was just very very delighted. And then Jim Goodwin said, you know, in the post match that he, he wants everyone to enjoy their Saturday and they can enjoy that a few pints after that. And I think many probably would have. Um, and it was just sort of a, a bit of a good feeling to have actually won a game convincingly in the league and knowing that we do have a, a run of fixtures that we can, you know, maybe put a few together and we'll start to see how this season's going to shape up. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, I'm sure many did enjoy their, their Saturday evenings and have also enjoyed their Mondays at, at work as well, buoyed by the fact that the Dons picked up that three points at, at the weekend. And, you know, on that, that point there about the run of fixtures, that is something that we mentioned at the back end of last the last episode where we said, you know, we've got really a run of five league games where we should be looking to achieve 15 points. And we started that off in the in the perfect fashion with getting the three points at home against the Mirren. Yeah, we absolutely did. I think it's a very, very good platform. I think if we hadn't got a, a win at, in our first home game when there's a decent crowd as well, then you know automatically things would have started being all doom and gloom again and wondering, oh no, here we go again. Have we just signed a load of duds? Is that one we've got excited about for no reason? But no, we were entertaining. We, you know, the goals were flowing. The free flowing attacking football was there, um, and you know, it, it's a good platform to build off. Now we've got those first three points underway, and as you know, not only us but many have mentioned, it it could be a very good month for us. And thankfully, we've got off to a fantastic start. Yeah, and you know, we spoke about the importance of getting at St Mirren or getting at any team that comes to Tawdry, having that fast start uh, in games, especially at, at home, wanting to assert our, our domination on the game. Did you feel we did that on Saturday? To some sort of a degree, I feel like, I don't think we came out and started quite as sharp as, as we could have. And Jim Goodwin, I think, said that uh, post-match as well in his comments. Um, we looked a little bit, 
I don't know, a little bit shaky maybe, and we didn't quite start off dominating as as perhaps Jim Gruden would have wanted. And I don't think the, the change in the defence obviously helped that at all. Uh, I thought we did have some problems with Ayunga especially. Um, once we'd made that change, things were a little bit more hectic. And when there's a big body like that who knows exactly how to put himself about, uh, it's, it's going to cause problems. But um, thankfully we did you know, take a little bit more control of the game sort of once that five, ten, maybe fifteen minute uh, spell pass. Don't get me wrong, we still, you know, tried to make things happen in that time. It just wasn't sort of convincing and the passing maybe wasn't as crisp and players weren't quite as sharp as I hoped they would have come out to be. Yeah, and it's probably not helped as well in the the opening uh, exchanges when your left back that you've signed from Middlesbrough, Hayden Coulson, um, thanks for the correct pronunciation from his dad there, um, goes off injured um, under a very reckless challenge on his return to Pataudry, Declan Gallagher. Um, I think very lucky that it was only a yellow card because... You know, certainly on watching it back on, on sports scene and also on the Red TV highlights as well, you know, if, if certainly later on in the season when VAR becomes introduced into Scottish football, we could quite easily see not being a red card for Declan Gallagher. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it was wild. It, it was dangerous. It was forceful. That's just all around unnecessary. He knows he's not going to catch Hayden Coulson. Thank you, Steve. Big shout out to you for that one, uh, for the pronunciation. But... It, it, it was bad. It was terrible. And yeah, I think Declan Gallagher is very, very lucky um, to to have got away with that one. Thankfully, you know, things were put to, put to right later on in the game. Um, but it, it, it was a horror tackle. And um, on another day, maybe we would have seen red. Yeah, it was almost like they couldn't cope with what was coming down, down the left-hand side. Uh, obviously, we hope it's not a, a serious injury. Um, Jim Goodwin saying he fears it's maybe a bit of ligament damage. Just have to hope that the, the swelling goes down because obviously you've seen him in the moon boot come full time on Saturday and that when he gets his scan this week that, that the results come back in, you know, probably looking likely he will miss this this game coming against Motherwell this weekend. But let's hope that it is not long term and we're having to, to reshuffle our defence once again. Although... Callum, it, it did see Liam Scales move over to, to left back uh, in this game and it did allow um, the introduction of Liverpool loanee Leighton Clarkson who joined up, well, signed for the club late on Friday night, was officially announced at 10am once he'd met up with the with his teammates at the pre-match meal for, for breakfast and I think he said in his post-match interview, you know, there was at times during the game that he'd actually forgotten some of the, the names of the players he was playing with, but um, he certainly made an impact in the game, which we'll, we'll, we'll come on to. But, um, you know, I think I remember when the the name was announced, I said, who's he? What's he going to bring? Well, proved us all very wrong. What do you make of that that signing of Leighton Clarkson then? Um, well, put it this way, my, my thoughts changed um, massively between the time of, you know, when it was announced to about, you know, 3.45 p.m. on Saturday. Um, initially, I'll admit, didn't know who he was. Uh, but I thought, you know, a player on loan from a Premier League club, sometimes that doesn't go so well. See Matty Longstaff. Sometimes it can be okay, Teddy Jenks. And hopefully he's going to go one better now. Um, obviously, he's at Liverpool for a reason. Um, so, I, you know, I was kind of buoyed. I kind of thought maybe how much game time will he get with Conor Barron when he gets back fit? Uh, how it affects well the prepare of them really, but um, I think it is a body we needed in midfield, perhaps not the one uh, many will have wanted for uh, most of this summer transfer window. See Connor mm-hmm. Ronan, but um, certainly now looks to be a good addition uh, given the way how things went. Yeah, um, we'll we'll speak more about him when we come on to the goal itself, and maybe um, you'll hear more about him uh, depending on the editing of this episode um, shortly, because we are hoping to hear from um, Jack Gill, um, a Liverpool fan who does a lot of work with the the Liverpool uh, under twenty three squads. He's got a lot of stuff to say on Leighton, but he's currently on holiday, so depending on when we can we can get a hold of him in this episode going out, you may or may not hear from him on this episode, but but Calm back to the game itself, um, you said, you know, the the wrongs were maybe righted on Declan Gallagher when um, Liam Scales' goal-bound shot 
was blocked by the hand, despite his protestations that it was his chest, of Mr. Gallagher. And he was shown a, a second yellow and subsequently a red. Um, surprising that it wasn't a, a, a straight red? I don't know. I, so I find it hard to keep up with the rules in the hand, handball yeah. these days. But I you know, was reliably informed uh, that not a red card or not a penalty if, first of all, it's his supporting arm when it goes when uh, when it hits strikes the ball um however he does sort of readjust his body and then sort of kind of throw himself at it um so by the letter of the law if he's doing that and it's not just sort of supporting him red card i think the right decision and also just i think karma for what happened earlier really um and you know could happen to a nicer bloke could it declan gallagher so Thankfully, uh, he walked, albeit then, you know, it made the game a lot easier for us, which, you know, is welcome and uh, gave us a good chance for a big boy and to step up and get off the mark in the league. And oh boy, did he. Yeah, I thought it was very funny that the first thing the sports scene did around that, that penalty incident was try and defend the decision to award the penalty. But I think you're right when you, you see it by, behind the goal, um, you know, whether it's a supporting arm or not, he does kind of like go down, move his arm into the direction of the ball and um, big up Graham Shinney. No, not that one. Um, behind the goal, um, since you uh, identified yourself on Facebook of, in the highlights on Red TV, it was uh, quite enjoyable seeing your reaction to the, the handball um, in, incident. So, uh, yeah, it was that was very amusing. But Vinny must have been thinking, what do I need to do to score? Because... In the build-up to that as well, what an effort from him. Um, obviously, unlucky to see his curling effort rebound off the post and um, before, of course, Liam Scales following it up. But it just shows we've got that that confidence in the in the build-up to you know to show there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was some very very nice football. And um, you know, on another day that curls into the top corner, you know, kisses kisses the woodwork and, and goes in off it, and it looks even better than it would if it didn't uh, hit the woodwork. But uh, it was positive play. I like it from Vinny taking on that shot shows his confidence and you know good reactions from Scales to not take the best shot probably afterwards, but at least you know started playing at left back, getting forward in support as you'd want uh, Hayden Colson to do if he was on the park. So encouraging and yet yeah, definite penalty, no questions asked. And Boyan slots it away excellently. Not quite as emphatic maybe as as his other one, but still regardless. Oh, it was great, and I enjoyed his celebrations after as well. And Johnny Hayes as well, first to him again. They seem to be celebrating every goal that the other scores together. I love it. Yeah. He he obviously wants to rival that Yilber Boyan um, bromance in there. But but like you said, emphatic, I think, when you first described the penalty, and it really was straight into the side netting, same, same way that he went against Wraith Rovers, and once again leaving the goalkeeper with no chance when it came to his effort from the penalty spot and and really I suppose Callum you know when you you've kind of spoken there about that slow start when you get those kind of opportunities you, you've got to take them we did so and especially in home games I think it's imperative you then build on that and Aberdeen kind of went a bit relent, relentless and all out and really made some minimum pay for going down to 10 men. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when you're given a chance like that, um, and also them going down to 10 men, you need to make them pay and, you know, get the crowd on side as well. Good chance for uh, the players to get the fans excited and show us what they can do as well. Still relatively new new, and uh, still gelling as well. But yeah, the tails were up immediately after that, I think, both on the pitch and off it. And absolutely, I mean, the, the, the play definitely improved against 10 men as as you would expect it to. But um, it, it was good to see that they sort of put pedal to the metal. I got it right that time. Um, yep, yeah, and put, put Sitmer into the sword as well. I'm throwing out all the cliches. I'm going to stop now. Yeah. But uh, yeah. I, I'm just glad that we, we didn't sort of um, rest on our laurels and just relax. But we really went for it. I was, uh, I think, three for three there on your, your footballing cliches there. But I, I suppose that, that one point I want to pick up then on is the, the point you then made about the fact that this team hasn't yet properly gelled. You know, mm. I suppose this is kind of only the second game that, well, third game really, I suppose, if you're, you're counting the, the Wraith game with, with Boyan leading the line as well. So, you know, maybe still 
not fully up to speed, but we've, we're certainly getting to see how how good a signing he's going to become. But can you really judge just how good we're going to become based on that performance, or should we be a bit mindful given the fact that we did play, you know, a, a good chunk of this game against ten men? I think you do have to consider it. Uh, obviously, you know, we were definitely helped by the sending off by Declan Gallagher. Well, I don't know if he was on the park. Would he have gifted us more goals? I don't know. But I like how you're trying not to get carried away here. You're really I'm, trying hard I'm to reel. Really, it. I, thank you for noticing that. I am really trying to reel it in. We we looked very good. Look, we had to play what was in front of us, and and starting the passes of plays really starting to come together. I think Anthony Stewart came out afterwards and said, you know, you can now kind of sort of see us gel together. And I just think. You know, the more the month goes on, the more these partnerships and understandings of each other will um, st- start to develop and the stronger we will get. And I mean, Boyan apparently only at 75% match fitness, according to Jim Goodwin. So who well, knows what it'd be like at 100. And I just think, you know, with these games in August, it's the perfect chance for us to start building up, you know, the togetherness as a team, those understandings, the fitness as well uh, for a lot of the players and Build, build momentum and a platform for the rest of the season, really. Yeah, a hundred percent on that. That August is because I do think I think when the fixtures were were released, regardless of you know before we'd even seen what was going to be produced on the pitch in the transfer market, I really felt that August was going to be the perfect opportunity to build something in, in terms of a platform for the season going forward. I know we're only you know two games in, but there is a sense that something positive is building down at AB24 and hopefully we can carry that momentum into the game coming up this weekend, which of course we'll preview a bit later on. But the second goal, um, you know, you said in our in our prediction segment, it would be Johnny Hayes would be our, our top assist provider. And it was, of course, Johnny who did turn provider for, for Boyan. A, a ball into the corridor of uncertainty, I'm going to call it, but I think every time the ball came into the box, uh, the St. Mirren defenders were very uncertain on what to do. And what I love about this goal is it's not the prettiest on the eye, but it's that instinct that Boyan shows to get on the end of it, get in front of Trevor Carson and think, well, if no one else wants to deal with it, I'll have that. Thank you very much. Exactly. Exactly that. And I mean, he gambled. That's basically what it was. It was a, you know, deflect his ball in from Johnny Hayes, but a good bit of play from him to start with, and I'll definitely take the assist for him. Um, <laughs> but it, it's, it, as I said, it's strikers, it's strikers incident. It's a poacher's finish. It's sort of Adam Rooney esque, if if you like the amount of goals we saw him score like that. And it's good to have someone like that again. And I mean, as much as Trevor Carson probably should have claimed it, Charles Dunn even prior to that had a chance to just whack it clear before Boyan nicks in in front of Trevor Carson. But they didn't, and Boyan made them pay, and I love it. I absolutely love it. The fact he nicked in there, finished it off, and then, you know, we're comfortable at that stage, and it's so early on, too. Yeah, and I think that, you know, on that goal as well, it's kind of the sort of thing that, that Philip Mishov, like, when we were reading through his tweets in one of our preseason lives, was kind of that sort of predatory instinct that was kind of highlighted by him that was something we could look forward to. And that goal kind of really summarised it, but... Uh, on Charles Dunn as well, you know, there was a lot of kind of, you know, when we signed J. Emmanuel Thomas, that it, it was based on almost interviews, if you want, um, in terms of his performances against us, the fact that he turned in worldly performances, scored worldies against us. Well, if Charles Dunn was trying to do an interview for getting a job up at Aberdeen, he's, he's failed that miserably. Yeah, he didn't, I mean, he didn't cover himself in glory. None of the St. Men in defence really did. I mean, I don't know if many of them did at all on the park. Um, obviously, made very difficult by Declan Gallagher getting sent off. But if that's what Charles Dunn's got in him, I, I think we saw more than enough of that last season with David Bates and Declan Gallagher. Pass for me, yeah. even as cover. And if we're spending yeah. money on him as well. No, thanks. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And and I suppose from an Aberdeen point of view as well, you know, 2 0 up relatively, as you say, cruising at, at home. Uh, things can only get better by by going three 0 up um, by half time, and I don't think Leighton Clarkson, if he got much sleep on Friday night, would have dreamt of a better start to his Aberdeen career. I certainly don't think he expected to be on the pitch within the opening fifteen minutes, let alone finding himself. 
going in at halftime already being an Aberdeen goal scorer? I mean, obviously terrible for Hayden Coulson, but almost the best thing that could have happened late in Clarkson, just getting thrown in there. Um, and obviously we ended up in a very good position where he can just, you know, try and control the game as much as he can. And bloody hell, he walloped that one. And you'll struggle to find a, a sweeter strike than that this season, probably for, for Aberdeen. It, it was so calm, so composed. He obviously sliced one slightly wide, you know, earlier. Um, but he still showed that confidence. And as I must say, perfectly weighted ball back from Matty Kennedy too to, to set him up for it. And uh, there was no two doubts in anyone's mind as soon as the ball left Leighton Clarkson's boot that that was flying in and ah, what a way to announce yourself I mean he looks very young and we didn't nobody really knew who he was before this morning uh, this morning sorry Saturday morning and then he comes on does that and as well as all of that completely bosses the game regardless of the goal too I'm trying to not get carried away but it when he plays like that it's really hard not to yeah, I, I was a big fan of the the Liverpool account that you you sent me on WhatsApp. You know when he was going through the kind of stats that the Leighton had uh, in the game and just kind of how impressive they were, uh, and the fact that he ended it with Thundercunt scored one. Um, but then also said, you know, to any other kind of English fans looking in, don't look down on the Scottish Premiership because a lot of young players are now viewing Scotland as a platform to go and improve their game. You know, we've obviously had Madison up here, Michael Hector up here, and they've gone on to have decent enough careers in England. Madison was maybe more so than Hector. But, you know, there are players that are viewing coming up to Scotland as a decent platform. And, and you know, Leighton looks to be certainly in line with, with that. And I think Johnny Bain had watched a video on YouTube and, and messaged me saying, I think we've got the next Billy Gilmore. We, obviously, I wasn't up, Tawdry. Could, could you see maybe glimpses of that in, in Leighton Clarkson? Absolutely. I mean, not just in his appearance and build, although that did help, but he was very, very neat and tidy. If you imagine the way Billy Gilmore goes about the game, just controlling things, keeping things ticking over, but not just in sort of recycling the ball kind of way, in a positive manner, looking to make things happen. That's what Leighton Clarkson did. And, you know, it, it's a big comparison to make. But, uh, I mean, if we have, you know, half the player of Billy Gilmore hands for this season, even, even a quarter, then I will be very, very happy. But he does have that little bit about him. About him. And hopefully, you know, it's not a one-hit wonder uh, for Leighton Clarkson. You know, it's a good chance for him. There is sort of a root space in that midfield for us. As a creative player, he's got to go and grab it. And also, I suppose on the other hand, you know, you might worry about Connor Barron, how how he'll uh, react and how, how his game time will be affected. I mean, if it, if Leighton Clarkson pushes him on to do better, and he ends up with a starting spot as well, absolutely fantastic news, and it's a great problem to have. Um, so you know, here's hoping he can carry on, and I can imagine with the way he played, he'll be in that team sheet for for the game against Motherwell. Yeah, and I suppose, you know, the negative, if you want to call it that, connotations of signing Leighton Clarkson were, were around the potential development or hindering the development of the Kintour Kante in, in Connor Barron and how much his game time was going to be affected when he, of course, returns for injury. I think Jim Goodwin said he's a, a couple of weeks ago, a, a couple of weeks away, and I think, you know, we kind of maybe disputed if that's actually true or, or, or not. But I suppose, Calm, you know, it goes back to the point that Jim Goodwin made. I think it was after the Sterling Albion game where he said he wants quality in this team. He wants that strength and depth. And right now, looking at our midfield, certainly in the centre of midfield, mm -hmm. we are blessed with a lot of good players in there based on obviously just what we've seen so far. And it is going to cause Jim Goodwin a headache when Connor Barron does become fit because if Leighton Clarkson, of course, maintains this level of performance, you know, McCrory and Ramadani have built up an excellent partnership. There is a genuine question on where does Connor Barron fit into this team? Uh, there absolutely is. I mean, we will have to consider you know, where Ross McCrory fits into the team and that will depend on probably the fitness of anyone in that back four. Yeah. Um but, but it, is, it is a good problem to have. You know, when everyone's fit, you want that competition for places. And they'll push each other on. You've got good options if things aren't happening. Um, you know, after an hour or sort of 70 minutes in the game, um, you've, you've got players you can throw on and, you know, you can trust them to make a difference. And 
it's a good position to be in, one we you know haven't been in for a while. Even when we were sort of finishing second, third regularly, there was sort of still then only about 14 or 15 players that you could maybe, you know, think McInnes probably trust. Um, if we can, you know, build that up to, you know, maybe somewhere around 18 mark and things like that, where players that, you know, are of enough quality you can come on and impact the game now, as well as mm-hmm. having younger players that are going to develop like Ryan Duncan, etc. Mm-hmm. It's a pretty good spot. I, I suppose then, you know, mentioning the likes of Ryan Duncan, you've also got Connor McLennan as, as one of our midfielders. Do you think bringing in Leighton does potentially spell the end of a Pataudry career for the likes of Connor McLennan, maybe even Marley Watkins, although Marley Watkins may be clinging on to the hope that he can provide cover up front? And, and I suppose on Ryan Duncan, do you think this may be, uh, could lead to a, a little loan spell for, for Ryan just to get him you know, continuing his, his first team development, uh, albeit it'll have to be elsewhere? <sighs> Yeah, possibly. I mean, you know, obviously they're not in direct competition for places. Um, but, you know, the fact that Vinny seems to be relishing that the sort of 10 role and then him and sort of him and Hayes kind of rotating in there too. And Kennedy, I suppose, to a degree as well, as well as the options off the bench. It is sort of starting to look like that, that, that number 10 role isn't free for anyone. And there is just the two sort of more sitting centre midfielders. Um, I don't know. It, 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 it's Connor Clennon, I think, has to play football at this stage. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Ryan Duncan obviously has a lot of room for development. I still think it would be beneficial for him probably to go out on loan and um, probably championship level uh, b- by this stage. Um, you know, with the amount of pl- in the players that we have as options on the wing, obviously it depends on that Carl Roberts injury as well, um, which we, we've heard very little about. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I th- certainly think Connor McLennan. For him personally, he's still young, but if he goes somewhere now where he can go and play football every week, then maybe he can sort of reach towards that sort of potential that people maybe thought of him once upon a time. But right now, I just think there's too many bodies there, not enough playing time between them, and especially you know without Europe as well. I don't know. I feel sorry for him, but it might be time. It might be best for him to go and go and move elsewhere. Uh, yeah, and I suppose maybe on that that Callum Roberts injury is maybe going to we are going to have to wait and see the extent of that as you said there's not been a lot kind of disclosed on that which we're going to hope at, at this stage it is a good sign you know to tend to be the no news is good news we'll, we'll go down that route but it, it is maybe just showing that obviously Jim Goodwin saying he's still after one more creative midfielder so maybe does feel we are short there again in terms of cover we'll, we'll maybe speak about defensive cover in a little minute um, but yeah, maybe Jim's still feeling we need one more just just to keep us healthy in terms of competition in those wide areas. I, I hope he doesn't sign another winner because I'm getting a headache thinking about all the ones that could play out there. Um, surely with the addition of Shaden Morris, he's not going to get another one in. And I, I, I don't think surely not. On the stage as well. Surely not. I mean... I, I, I feel like there's other areas on the part. I feel like a right-back cover would be mar- far more essential than another forward option uh, and a centre-back as well, perhaps. Um, but, I mean, if we want to sign all the wingers in the world, then, you know, it'll be entertaining one way or another. So, look, feel, feel I, fed ahead of Jim. I'm, I'm happy. And I think at this stage as well, I feel that we're almost having to get rid of somebody before someone then comes in. And I do agree. I think right now... I would. I'm more concerned about our defensive cover than I am our further forward, and obviously that's you know dependent on the fact of how serious this injury to Colson is. But you know Jack McKenzie was in Colcoms on Red TV at the weekend and said you know he's still two to three weeks away. Wouldn't give a very definitive answer. I'm still not fully convinced on him as a, as a left back, but. You know, obviously, you saw how, how Liam Scales got on on, on Saturday at, at left-back. Could you see us potentially, depending again on the seriousness of the injury, Scales going out to left-back and us then having to shoehorn somebody into that left-centre-back role, which I think Jack would probably be better suited at? Uh, 
I mean, possibly. I don't know. I feel like if Jack McKenzie's going to play half a minute left back, Liam Scales, his height, his ball carrying skills coming out from the back would be better as Anthony Stewart. Sometimes his ball play skills, not so great uh, from what we've seen so far. And keep McKen- McKenzie out wide. I suppose it'll be interesting if perhaps McCrory comes in at centre-back and scales at left-back. I think that's probably more a short-term solution. Um, but I still think another centre-back to be added would, would be ideal because clearly Bates isn't trusted, despite the fact how many times Jim Green's going to say, you know, he's got, another, he's got two years left on his contract. He's still an Aberdeen player. If he's here, then that's fine. I don't, I'm not buying it. Yeah, and I, I still agree. I still feel that we're short on the right side of defence because obviously Anthony Stewart's definitely a right sided. I don't think he will be comfortable on the on the left from certainly what we were told by George from the Wick and Win. You know, also, you know, we were we were told about his ball playing ability. He does prefer the, the long ball ball rather than playing out from the back. But you know, with Jaden Richardson our only recognised really right back I suppose you've got Jack Milne there in terms of covering in at, at, at centre back. If you know, in the meantime, if we want to move scales out wide for for the game coming up this weekend, but still, I think right back. You know, I think that the ABZ guys suggested you know Matt Kennedy and Ross McCrory as potential cover. Um, although I maybe use the word cover quite loosely uh, around that because you know we we've seen how influential Ross can be in the middle of the park and. You know, Matt Kennedy's had a good season so far in that, you know, wide area. We don't want to then be affecting those players' confidence, I think more so in Matt Kennedy's case, by moving him to a position that he's not exactly comfortable in. Because I think right now when you've got a confident Matt Kennedy, you've got a good Matt Kennedy. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And if you've got question marks over Jaden Richardson's defensive abilities when he's actually meant to be a right back... yeah. Uh, Matt Kennedy is going to be even worse and um, I think we're then also lacking a bit more height as well at the back if Matt Kennedy moves into right back for me I would just rather you know Ross McCrory slide it across there even then still not ideal and I would like someone brought in as cover for right back someone to, not even just as cover someone to compete and push uh, Jane Richardson on it even more because right now I mean if Ross McCrory gets injured we are struggling a lot we're all of a sudden a lot lighter in the midfield a lot lighter at centre back and we have basically no plan B for right back so hopefully Jim Goodwin's got an eye on someone and it's uh, move a bit for the rest of the transfer window yeah Jesus, uh, yeah I, I like I said I do think you know obviously there's a lot of talk around around Connor Ronan and, and the, the potential on that deal whether that may or may not happen but we've dragged that out for long enough. I'd rather, you know, put more focus into uh, a defensive signing between now and the end of the transfer window. And if, if Ronan's going to be a deadline day signing, that then then so be it. But I think there's more important positions currently to, to focus on. And that's only been heightened by, obviously, the, this injury that, that, that Coulson's picked up uh, and obviously the prospect of having to shuffle our defence uh, once again. But we'll, we'll get back to the game on, on Saturday, Calm, since we've sidelined massively. Um, 3 0 up at half time, uh, and as I said, cruising, you, you tend to see in games of, of that manner that the second half is a real non event. The game just peters out quietly. Did you did you feel that Aberdeen kept their pedal to the metal, to, to quote yourself, or was there, was there a case of you know taking our foot off the gas at, at, at times? We still had plenty of chances, uh, don't get me wrong, throughout the second half. We probably should have taken an extra one or two, maybe even three. Um, I think St Mirren looked a little bit more organised still to a degree um, as as well, despite then gifting us you know, the fourth goal completely. But I, I, maybe there was a lot of my complacency. I, still th- I think Jim Goodwin maybe wouldn't have been... I mean, it's hard to be unhappy with a 4-1 defeat, but maybe we'd have liked us to really go for it a little bit more and, um, you know, put out a real statement and even more than 4-1. But we still have plenty of chances. Just sometimes maybe, you know, especially with Boyan Miofsky, perhaps lacking that sharpness. So, so when he does get to 100%, he, we will see him finish those off. There was one, you know, when he was, he sort of seemed to wait forever and he took it on his weaker right foot, um, which, you know, he's sharp. Then maybe, maybe he gets a shot off slightly earlier. But... Um, it would have been nice to have another couple of goals in the second half, uh, more than we did. But 
Um, I don't know. I think it, it, it's really hard to stay that sharp and that focused and, and that aggressive, you know, for the full 90. Yeah, and I suppose like on, on Miofsky as well, we obviously saw um, him cut back onto that, that right side in the, the build-up to the third goal as he, as he chased his, his hat-trick as well. But maybe that will come, as you said, you Goodwin commenting on his fitness and, and, and sharpness as well. But he's certainly an exciting talent that I can't wait to to see more of um, it, this season and especially starting this weekend against Motherwell. But, you know, you said St Mirren gifted us the fourth goal. I think Alan Muir very generously um, gifted St Mirren a, a way back into the game, a, a probably, or certainly gifted them the opportunity to score a goal because, I mean, you'll see soft penalties this season, but that a decision on when Johnny Hayes and Greg Hilty come together is is very soft, although... Uh, as you said to me on WhatsApp last night, you know, maybe somewhere else on the pitch, the referee probably awards a free kick, but in the 12 yard box, that, that just seems ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, it would probably be a soft free kick and, but you could like understand why it's given perhaps, but as a penalty, it is really, really soft. And I thought that at the time, you know, it, there is, you know, a bit of a nudge, etc. but, Johnny Hayes has got that old man strength. You know when men grow older and are even older and then they somehow develop the strength out of nowhere and they don't know how to get, get out there. That's Johnny Hayes right now and that's what happened. And Greg Kelly went absolutely flying but there really wasn't much in it at all. But I just think Al Muir was probably desperate to point this spot. And who, he, by the way, rubbish. Absolutely awful. I mean, you sound surprised. Um, in saying that, but but who is when it comes to refs in this game? But um, Kel Roos gets a strong hand to it. He's got to be disappointed that he hasn't kept that out, don't you think? Yeah, I think I, I'm not disappointed. I think um, I don't know if there's too much that he could have done, but once you get that hand to it, you know goalkeepers are going to be absolutely kicking themselves uh, that, that that they didn't make the save. I thought he was quite unlucky. Me on another day, he does you know get slightly stronger hand to it and, and keeps it out, but. Uh, it wasn't a great penalty right, either, but, um, you know, St Mirren scored and whoop de doo Yeah. Um, I suppose, you know, again, we, we spoke about VAR at the, the top of the episode with, with Declan Gallagher. My only takeaway, because Red TV highlighted it um, on on the highlights when, you know, Alan Muir gave him a strict talking to about the, the rules and having to stay behind your line, that had he actually saved the penalty, um, come October, November time, whenever this bloody thing is being introduced, um, St Mirren would have been able to retake the penalty as um, he wasn't behind the line, but something that tedious that we're going to have to, to look forward to come the second half of the season. Oh, I can't believe they're introducing it halfway through a season, which just seems so ridiculous, but I will save that round for another day near the time. Yeah, especially when I think the first game that we're going to have to experience in it is against Celtic. So you just know that's going to be a long-winded episode of the the, the podcast. But um, of course, gifts, as you said, you know, we gave one to Samirin, or as I'm going to say, Alan Muir gave one. But Samirin gifted us yet another easy goal, thanks to some more atrocious defending. But look, you have to highlight the quality of the through ball from Christian Ramirez. Perfectly weighted perfect vision and then you know you might say it's a gift from St Mirren but take nothing away from that finish from Duke who very much enjoyed that goal as did everybody in the red shed by the looks of it absolutely I mean Ramirez's build up play and things like that and what else he offers other than being a penalty box striker sometimes comes up the question but not only the accuracy of the pass uh, through to Duke but the weight of the pass and the timing of it to make sure he didn't hadn't run offside excellent from Christian Ramirez and you know hopefully that gives him a little bit of confidence as well uh, but Duke goodness me I mean it was head down Vinny was going alongside and I thought will he square it sort of similar to the Ramirez and Duke one uh, in the Wraith game but I don't think there was ever any chance in any world where Duke's going to uh, pass up that opportunity I mean he took like a, sl- a slight little touch that he knocked it slightly wider uh, right before he chipped it I just thought that sort of gave him like a slightly better angle to chip it for the far corner um, over over Carson. And the fact that, you know, nicked in off the post and then how absolutely mental he went. Oh, he loved it. 
small part of me wishes that he maybe missed just so I could see how angry the little muscle boy get got. But goodness me, fantastic finish. Went absolutely crazy. The Red Shed loved it. Clearly a goal that meant a lot to him. And I really enjoyed watching people just sort of fall down uh, running towards the front. And, uh, you know, it, 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 it capped it off nicely. And hopefully that provides him a lot of confidence going forward. So I think if that went on, you know, like another few games, you know, of games where he's making sub appearances, that might start to get to him in a new country and things like that if he's not getting his first goal. But there we go. Perfect way to finish the game. Wraps it up nicely. Cheeky dink. Perfect. Yeah, and I think for me that was the thing, you know, speaking to Joe, um, who of course joined us on the show to to do the Getting to Know You uh, episode around Duke himself, and that was one thing he said, he will be that impact player off the bench, he will, you know, score these crazy goals, and you maybe want to put that under a crazy goal in terms of the, the scenes that we saw um, behind it, but, you know, he also said that he is a confidence player, and it could affect him if you know, he does go a few games without without a goal and he has now got that. And I think you're absolutely right. In terms of confidence, loads of players will have taken confidence from that game. Christian Ramirez, the fact that he's, you know, back involved and contributing in one way or another. Duke, he will take confidence from scoring. Majowski as well, getting his first league goals under his belt, not one but two as well. You know, you've got Vinny still looking lively. He'll be frustrated Obviously, mm-hmm. not not getting the goal from that curling effort, but take confidence that that it's going to come. Um, and as well, there's just loads of other players that said, you know, maybe the, the only niggling thing is the fact that the defenders will will be frustrated that we didn't keep the clean sheet. But you know, when you're going to get soft decisions against you, outside of that, I, I guess St Mirren really didn't ever threaten to score. You know, only the one shot on target. No, not not at all. I thought we did actually defend a, a lot better, despite you know maybe some initial shakiness throughout some of the ball playing, as mentioned. Mainly Anthony Shoot. I think there was three occasions where he gave the ball away from trying to play it out for the back, which is a little bit of a concern. But hopefully, you know that will start to improve as well. But great for everyone, you know, to to get that confidence uh, as well. I think everyone enjoyed that in the ground of a red persuasion too. Um, I just know Vinny is going to be desperate to get in on the action now as yeah. well. You know, since two games gone, he's not scored a goal. He's not going to be happy about it. There's going to be one coming against Motherwell. That's my prediction. But uh, no, absolutely fantastic all round and very, very happy. Other yeah. than the pie situation. Yeah, which we'll come on to in a second. Because, of course, we did say we were going to do memorable moments um, from the game. So before you go into maybe a more unmemorable moment, what would be, obviously you were at the game, so uh, this is down to you this weekend, what is your memorable moment from um, the victory over St Mirren? It would be easy and, you know, petty to pick, you know, Declan Gallagher getting sent off. That would be easy. But <laughs> Duke's finish, how crazy he went, the wild celebrations, not only from him, but then from the Red Shed, who was celebrating in front of him and he was keen to get involved with, that had to be my moment of the game. And hopefully, you know, that, that gives him that confidence, that platform to go on and, you know, become become more of the player that we were hoping. Then we, you know, you know, you talk to Joe and I listen to it back. Yeah, and, and on the Red Shed as well, there was a lot of, you know, positive comments I, I was seeing um, on Saturday night and Sunday on, on how good the Red Shed was on Saturday. Just a, just a word for them and, and how much that, you know, the atmosphere was like on, on Saturday. Yeah, absolutely fantastic. Really good when, you know, I can turn to see them and they're bouncing about, you know, making a great atmosphere, supporting the team. Really annoying when bloody St Mirren have got a drum night next to me, however, and I can't hear a thing. But, uh, you know, at times when, you know, the St Mirren fans were maybe weren't so buoyed, the Red Shed were in the groove, absolutely. And uh, fantastic. I think that, that that's another, you know, great positive for this season. I think not only that, but the fact we're going to be shooting towards them in the second half, that encourages them and, they, and then the players sort of feed off that, and then the, likewise the fans feed off it with each other. And um, so for a home game against St Mirren, fantastic. I mean, fourteen thousand in the ground in total as well. Uh, not all in the red shed, don't be silly. But uh, it, it, it's a good, it's a good sign, and hopefully, if we can start building things this August, things will only get better. Yeah, absolutely. Things to come, as I said, you know, crowd. Maybe people would have hoped to see more this weekend. I know the Brewdog AGM for 
those that, that like that sort of beer um, maybe have got a decision to make on a clash of attendance, but nowhere I'd rather be. Um, of course, there is also the club um, have got pie of the month. Um, unfortunately for you, Lasagna pie did not make its appearance. It was uh, the, the mealy pie, which looked bone dry from the pictures that the club tweeted and also that, that Red Mist 1903 tweeted us and he did say it was about a 6 out of 10. It did look like it needed a lot of gravy. Um, now we do know that the club do like listening into the fan podcast. So Callum, what is your complaint for this weekend around the pie in the kiosks? Now I would really have loved to have no complaints other than about the referee for this podcast. However, first of all, they got my hopes up because... At the kiosk above Section S, still says Pie of the Month, lasagna. So, first of all, that's getting people excited for no reason. Then, yeah. went in the 15th minute. And I know, you know, it's, it's difficult catering for a lot of people. I do understand it. Went in the 15th minute. Macaroni pie wasn't ready. Mince and mealy pie wasn't ready. I don't think patodry pies were ready either. Only steak. So, that wasn't great. They said, come back in 10 minutes. So went back in 10 minutes, macaroni pies were ready, apparently. They were so soggy, it was unbelievable, but they probably wasn't helped by mine and other pressure. Mince and mealy pies, not ready. So how can you be in the middle of the game and have not have not have pies ready? What's going on with that? I hope they've got the pies on for next week. Now, shop. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't even get to try the mince and mealy pie. Raging. Well, I look forward to your review of it next week. If, they're if I get one. Yeah, if they're prepared in time. Um, obviously, results as well this weekend, um, probably going in, in favour of the Dons as well. Uh, Edinburgh Derby being a draw United, um, suffering their European hangover going down to, to Livingston. So um, Aberdeen rising to fifth, as we said, the only way is up. Um, you know, Tucked in nicely in behind the, the two Edinburgh teams there. It is, you know, as we said, going into this weekend's game against Motherwell, we have now got a platform to, to go and build. You know, you highlighted players are now got confidence. We've got a bit of momentum. Fans seem buoyed by what they, what they saw. Let's hope going into this weekend that that continues. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Thankfully, you know, results went our way, as as you just mentioned, which has cheered me up after Pie Gate. But uh, it, it is a good platform and Motherwell... Pretty good opposition if you're going to hand select one um, based on current form, maybe not some of last season. Um, but, you know, they're in a bit of disarray. They've only signed, you know, a few players. They've not got a permanent manager in charge right now. Uh, they've just lost this at Johnston. And uh, Stevie May scored the winner, which after they came back in added time to equalise originally and then chucked it away. So they're not in a good spot. And I now am realising that all of this is then pointing towards them upsetting me greatly. However, in theory, with the way we're playing, with the way they're going right now, could be a good chance to make it six from a possible six in the last two numbers. Yeah, quick maths. Um, of course, as you said, Motherwell do travel north. And, you know, in a bit of maybe disarray, as some Motherwell fans would suggest, we would have hoped to have uh, Gogsy um, come on the show. But, of course, um, he's got other... Uh, more important matters other than speaking on, on podcasts to deal with at this time. We do um, hope that his dad is found safe and well uh, as soon as possible. Um, and I know many other mother, Motherwell fans um, also don't exactly enjoy speaking about their team just now, let alone watching um, their team. But even Stephen Hamill, of course, in temporary charge of the Steel Men, coming out after that defeat to St. Johnson, as you said there, Calm, saying that the squad needs surgery, not mm. exactly the sort of glowing report that fans would want to hear when they've now got to go and travel to Aberdeen. I'm sure Motherwell fans that watch sports scene as well will be slightly worried after seeing the way they defended at the weekend. Yeah, I mean, I uh, would be worried if Ricky, Ricky Lamy was available um, just for players' fitness reasons. I mean, they, they, they don't look great at the back at all. They look very unorganised. You know, you've got Stephen O'Donnell playing left-back. And he's come out and said that players need, uh, no, Motherwell need players more than they do a manager right now, which I think sort of tells you the situation, Mark, considering their manager was sacked before the league season or left by mutual consent, I should say, and they still need players more than a manager right now. They're not in a good way. No, they're not. But as you said, 
you know, we don't want to get too ahead of ourselves. You know, I was caught. Well, I was going to say I was cautious. I definitely wasn't. I was very confident going into to last weekend's game against St Mirren, you know, when I called them the ideal opposition. But given the fact that Motherwell seemed to be our bogey side, you know, I think I said to you as well that, you know, last October when we had that, that good run of results, Motherwell came to town and everyone thought, that's fine, we'll continue that run. And they, they turned us over 2-0. They are that side that, you know, is a bit Jekyll and Hyde when they are on a bad run of form. They pluck this random good result out of nowhere. And let, let's hope that that's not the case um, come five o'clock on Saturday. Yeah, I mean, you know, they had a couple of big results. Uh, well, they definitely had one massive result that had a massive impact on Aberdeen's last season. Um, I don't know. It's scary because they, they do sometimes like to just upset Aberdeen lots. And it feels like, although everything logically is pointing towards you know, a good Aberdeen win. We just know that everything could potentially backfire and it could be chaos. Kevin Van Veen will score two of his seven goals of the season against us at the weekend with the other five against us as well. Um, it's concerning, and especially with the way um, sometimes Ayunga called us, caused us some problems for, for St Mirren as well. Uh, I thought he ruffled some feathers, but hopefully uh, Anthony Stewart's training uh, with I can find will prepare will prepare him properly for Kevin Van Veen. I'm trembling over my words at the thought of him. Yeah, and I, I suppose that's you know we put that in the notes as well for this episode is is obviously dealing with the threat that Kevin Van Veen poses to our defence. Obviously, as you said you know showed that last season when he just seemed to only ever score against us. But obviously, with us having maybe a bit of concern defensively over where Liam Scales plays. What what do you think we do defensively? Do we keep that centre back partnership of Scales and Stewart uh, to deal with the threat of Van Veen, or you know I think I seen someone say online today about potentially Jack Milne coming into the centre of defence, or 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 what do you see? Because obviously, how did the defence reshuffle in that that game against St Mirren? So defence was Scales, McCrory, Stewart, Richardson, and. We were a little bit shaky to start with, but we, we got a little bit better and obviously it was helped by the lack of St Mirren's attacking threat. That would, for me, be the defence we go into the Motherwell game because, you know, McCrory and, and Stuart both performed very, very well at, at Parkhead despite the result. And um, Liam Scales looked really good going forward still, got down that left-hand side plenty uh, against St Mirren. And I just, although with the way Scott McKenna came in against a Louis Moat-led Motherwell. And as much as I would love for the replica of the story with Jack Milne and Kevin Van Veen, I just think he's not, you know, bulked up. Maybe not, you know, I think he would just get bullied physically if he came in uh, against against Motherwell. And I absolutely don't want David Bates to come in on that left-hand side to centre back as well. Uh, and then in that case, then, if that's the, the, the four we go with, you expect Clarkson to then go in alongside Ramadani and build from what they they produced on Saturday against St Mirren and deal with the likes of Sean Goss, who, who likes to certainly shoot from distance, um, judging by the highlights um, from Saturday's game against St Johnson. But we know Motherwell can be very tenacious in the midfield, mm-hmm. so I'm, I'm very much looking forward to, to Ramadani. Um, dealing dealing with that as well, but but I suppose then that would be the natural um, filling in of the hole in midfield if McCrory drops back. Yeah, I, I I think so. I think maybe Povara maybe better ready ready physically, but technically and after the way Leighton Clarkson performed, I don't think you can leave him out um, at all if, if McCrory drops back to the defence. Ramadani might have to do a lot of the heavy heavy lifting, but saw a lot of Liverpool fans saying that Leighton Clarkson needed to bulk up. Now's your perfect time uh, to show us what you're made of and, and them too, if they bother watching the highlights. I don't know if they care enough. No, but but on Ramadani as well, you know, you know, people are going to, in this team, are going to steal the headlines. Majolski, rightly so. Scales has done so um, earlier this season as well with his defensive displays. And, and Matty Kennedy as well has, has taken, you know, some headlines for the way he's kind of brought himself back into form and, you know, Obviously, Callum Roberts, before his injury at the weekend, was you know maybe rumoured to be able to dislodge him in the starting eleven. Mm-hmm. But Gilbert Ramadani is looking like an excellent bit of business by the club to, to go and get him in. I, I'm pretty sure in that Stephen Gunn interview as well, it was actually Boyan they were overwatching, and it was then Gilbert they 
kind of noticed in the game as well. So obviously some some good scouting work from, from Darren Mowbray, but for £100,000 looks an absolute steal. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, he certainly strikes me from what I've seen from his interviews and things like that as a character that, you know, it is determined to succeed. He, he's no... He, he's not a soft touch, is Ramadani, but also technically, you know, very, very good. He, you weren't used the word tenacious uh, just a moment ago. He, he looks exactly that, and he just has a fantastic engine. I'm sure he's probably not quite exactly where he wants to be, or Jim Gooden like him to be, to be either right now. And the more he sort of settles in Aberdeen, the more understandings he gets, and that's also, you know. So he's played with McCrory in the midfield, he's played with Paul Vara in the midfield, and now he's playing with Leighton Clarkson. I mean, that's three different partners as well, so that can't be easy when you're trying to settle in. And uh, he just looks really, really good. So hopefully plenty more of the same against Motherwell because, you know, often in the middle of the park, games like this are decided. So we need a big game from him, and I fully expect him to deliver. Yeah, uh, as do I. Another player I fully expect to deliver if given the opportunity to this weekend is Bojan Miowski. Um, you know, plenty of chances to increase on his two goals um, on Saturday. And certainly from the defending that we've seen from Motherwell this season, you know, St Mirren um, created uh, plenty of chances and it was for an inspired Liam Kelly that they didn't score. And, you know, St Johnson managed to, to get two uh, against them for, from some on the back of some absolutely terrible defending. So um, I think, you know, the likes of Boyan, Matty Kennedy, Vinny, uh, even Johnny Hayes to an extent as well are going to be licking mm-hmm. their lips at, at trying to get this Motherwell defence, get in behind. And let's just hope that, you know, when we, when we speak next week, um it's back to back positive podcasts that we're, we're talking to, and you know, I'm I'm smiling because there's nothing better than speaking positively um, about the Dons, and and you know, there's so much optimism this season. God, I feel like you're gonna get get carried away in a second. I know, but there's also now a small voice in my head that's going, it's all going to go wrong, it's all going to go wrong, it's all going to go wrong. So I really hope that's not the case because I am genuinely really, really excited. I am confident as well, which sometimes I do get carried away. But in in to be honest, I usually talk myself into that after being terrified of what's going to happen. So fingers crossed we, you know, we can uh, add another three points uh, to, to that league table and um, get, get another performance too and hopefully a clean sheet as well. That would be fantastic. I'm sure if we deliver another performance like Saturday and add a clean sheet to that, oh, Jim Goodwin will be absolutely delighted. Yeah, it'll be loads of pints for everybody come Saturday if we get the clean sheet on top of the performance. Um, and as I said, thank you to all of you that continue to tune in, like the video, subscribe, leave reviews on the audio platforms. Um, let's hope that there's more good things to talk about next week. Until then, thanks very much for tuning in to Red Tinted Glasses. Go ahead. Just thought I'd do that again since it worked last time. <laughs> <laughs>